Okay, so looks like it's uh, time. So let me start it. Uh, in this presentation, I would like to give you a quick uh, introduction what happens in the last in the last year from more from user perspective. There's a lot of changes inside, but what's what's visible. So. Uh, what uh, will be content of this presentation is uh, a bit talking about usability changes. Uh, there are some changes in uh, how we manipulate config files and what's the benefits for users. There's, of course, new features, so also some new bugs. And there is uh, we working on new storage stack. It's not yet deployed anywhere, so it's just it's not possible to see it yet. So regarding usability, uh, we try quite a lot on improving uh, error reporting. Uh, basically, when something goes wrong, uh, and if you get some useless uh, error that say nothing, then yeah, usually customers are, or users aren't happy because they would like to know some details, what's going wrong, how they can improve it. So a few examples uh, what we allows in uh, what, what we improves in this area is uh, when uh, there is a non-blocking installation error, which currently is just in a red line, a red, a red color in installation summary. Uh, we now also raise a pop-up and it has two benefits. First is that it's really visible, it, that it's not just warning, it's non-blocking error. So it means if you are really, really sure, you can try to do installation, but there's high probability it will fail. And second advantage is that it's easily catchable by, by OpenQA. So OpenQA, when they see some strange pop-up, start complaining, I don't like it, and that's not how it should look like. Another improvement is uh, you can pass a registration URL at uh, installation command line. Uh, it's mainly interesting for SLE users, but uh, we plan to allow this also for other URLs. URLs is uh, if, you, if you, in past, if you write it wrong, it will just raise error, there's wrong URL, and you have to start from scratch installation. It's quite currently a pop-up shown that uh, the, the URL is wrong and it allows you to write it correctly from install so you can just continue. Uh, also, uh, we improve uh, checking from mandatory installation packages. Uh, for example, how it works uh, for a bootloader, you need the grab to package uh, on target system. Otherwise, you have a problem when you upgrade kernel. So bootloaders say to software proposal, we are, uh, would like to have here a grab to and some other packages, but uh, users, what users can do is that they can open software proposal and say, yeah, I don't like grab to, so, so deselecting it. And uh, problem with this approach is that, of course we allow it, but uh, bootloader won't work as you expect because it cannot be installed. So what happens now is that it's a non-blocking error which says there's mandatory packages that we need and if you proceed, probably some parts of your system won't work as you expected. Uh, another quite nice feature is uh, recovery when there is a broken bootloader configuration. Uh, how it can happen, uh, for example, if your disk crash and you have a backup, so you restore a backup to different disk and s somehow boot machine, for example, via DVD, which have option boot, boot system from disk. Then you start a bootloader just module and it will report uh, we should boot from disk that I that I don't know because uh, we use UDEF IDs. There is some ID of disk and that's different disk. So it complain that it cannot boot. 
And what's happened now, it reports something is wrong, uh, configuration is broken, and you have a button to propose it from scratch. So we just say, okay, propose me from scratch, and it proposes working solution. You, you confirm it, and you have, again, working bootloader as you expected. Yeah, and last but not least, a uh, slightly expert topic. I'm not sure how much of you try to boot via serial console, but its parameters are quite tricky because there is something like speed of that console, device inside stuff. And uh, in the past, if you uh, write it wrong, it just report you, you write wrong parameters. So currently, it will also write you a help text how the parameters should look like and explain each part and also it's explained it in help currently in better way. So also if you are not familiar with server console it will help you to, to configure it. And of course I would like to thank to our usability team in YAS, uh, in SUSE, which we uh, often discuss these issues and they propose some some solution that doesn't look, uh, that's more from user perspective and not so much from developer one. Okay. Next one. Yeah. Okay, uh, another usability improvement is that uh, we get reports that uh, uh, half a gig is no longer enough for installation of OpenSUSE. And there are some requirements because currently you, you install to various virtual machines and such stuff, so we should reduce a footprint. So what, what we did is that we analyze uh, usage of memory in installation and reduce it. But I would like to give here a slight warning that it really depends on number of your online repositories be because we still fit only roughly. So there is a very small space of memory that, that, that keeps there. So if you have a lot of online memories during installation, you, it usually exceeds that amount of memory you should fit into it. Yeah, and... Uh, Another usability improvement is that we get some report from, uh, I think it's student on university that have problems with, uh, yeah, problem with eyes. So, so we need a high contrast, high contrast uh, theme from installation. So we did some analysis. We also, uh, in the end, contact some some researcher on the university about the various. Uh, uh, low vision problems and uh, what what we have now is that we add another three themes to installation that allows for various uh, problems uh, different themes so it's visi more visible okay uh, another part is how we assess uh, configuration files uh, just quick intro uh, the, to uh, CFA, which is Config Files API, which is a, a framework that we use. It uses a layered approach, so it tries to separate uh, reading content, parsing content, and then high-level assessing it. The advantage uh, above old solution is uh, uh, there is a precise command manipulation, so it means not just, not any command should be removed, but also if uh, Yast wants to add some smart comments like do not touch this, it's, it's uh, configured by Yast, it's now possible. And uh, it uses uh, quite a lot of gas lenses, so it means we don't need a right uh, open parsers usually. If Augas support it, it's, we can just reuse what's already existing. And another advantage is that we contributing to Augas upstream. We already fix one or two stuff there and improve some lenses when, when some parts doesn't fit. Uh, one example is in NTP. We, for example, allow new syntax for IPv6 uh, restriction 
and we, we of course send it to upstream. So even not the just the yes, benefits from this change. Uh, what we improve in this uh, config files API uh, in last year is that uh, we try to do a smarter writing. Previously, the parser creates some tree, and uh, we create some internal internal representation of this tree, manipulate with it, and then write it whole back. So it means uh, in August everything is marked as dirty. Still, it, uh, no comments will be removed, but uh, some white spaces, some formatting will be removed because uh, Augeas tries to keep it only if the, the element is untouched. If, if you modify it, it, it will also uh, write it somehow from, from scratch. So what we do is now that we, in our internal uh, tree, also keep these flags if stuff is modified, add, removed, and then we apply it to using Augas own operations. So there's stuff like remove it, uh, add something, or just modify, it. and that allows Augas to do more smarter editation. And in the end, uh, diff is really small, and really edits only parts that just needs. So the rest of your file is uh, untouched. Yeah, and also we try uh, to optimize it. There's, uh, we have old bugs that ETC host uh, have more than 10,000 lines of, of uh, config. Uh, the, the, the real usage is that uh, they use some kind of software that do some kind of blocking by writing stuff to ETC hosts. And in the end, their blacklist is so big that it's uh, so many, so many lines with uh, sending hosts to uh, some, some blocking uh, gateway. So we tried with CFA, this old bug, if it helps. And uh, as you can see lower in measurement, it's uh, around two times faster but uh, we think it's not enough and it's time to at least uh, learn to play with uh, Ruby Profiler, which really, really rocks. It's uh, something like, I think it's comparable to, for example, scene profilers. And we optimize it by some, some caching. When we analyze output, we analyze it, and the result is that it's, again, two times faster. So just with using a different uh, parser and with optimizing it, the result is that uh, previously just opens uh, uh, more, um, for more than one minute, and now it's 20 seconds, which is still far from perfect, but yeah, it's really book, uh, a really big file. and. I am not so sure that Augas is the, the correct tool to edit files that have 10,000 lines. Because, yeah, it's really big. Yeah, and uh, we still uh, increasing usage of that CFA. Originally, it was introduced for bootloader, which have various formats. And now we use it also, as I mentioned, for ETC host, also from NTP. As I mentioned, we, we, we found there is a bug in Augeas lens that uh, prevent uh, parsing a new IPv6 option, so we also fix it. We use it for uh, modifying uh, zip configuration. Also, uh, if you see the EMOS presentation at uh, this morning, we, we are now somehow configuring Puppet and Salt, so we also using it for these new parts of YAST. Okay, so new features. Yeah, uh, it depends how much you are paranoid, but there is something like trusted booting that verifies integrity of whole your system from a very start. So for legacy booting, it starts at BIOS for newer 
it should start on EFI, but uh, just and also installation and uh, whole open source doesn't have support yet for EFI. So that's one of a uh, new feature that there is a new software that's uh, it's called uh, TPM2 and uh, it allows booting for EFI. Yeah, the, the sad part that they create a new software and they just drop a legacy booting. So we, we would like to su support uh, both of it. So the result is that in UI, it looks like just one checkbox. I want trusted booting, but uh, in backend, it's two different uh, software and slightly different uh, configuration. Yeah, but in UI, it looks like it's same and now we support uh, trusted booting also on EFI. Yeah. Another part is uh, CAS and Kubik. If you see a presentation uh, yesterday, it's uh, some orchestration. Yeah, it's a platform for container orchestration. What adaptation in EAST is mainly that we create that simplified installer. Maybe you see it yesterday, it's just one click installer. And there's a lot of adaptations to, to really have a small and uh, install and also to allow this uh, to be done automatically way. So that's how this simplified installation looks like. As you can see, uh, only mandatory part is a password for root and uh, the confirmation of password. Yeah, because we don't want to prefill it, pre -prefill it for you. But other parts are, are automatically proposed. Uh, for example, NTP servers are obtained by uh, SLP discovery. And the rest is just proposed and you can click install and it will work. Yeah, one uh, different uh, feature for OpenSUSE is uh, if you use Tumbleweed, you may be noticed in installation is new desktop selection. Now it uh, still the first first draft. Uh, there is still in queue some improvements to this part, but uh, let me uh, introduce why why we did it because there is also some controversy about it. Like why there is not Enlightenment, XFCE, and whatever desktop you like. And in effect, that's the exact reason. There is now so many forks and attempts to write uh, own desktop solution and everyone would like to have it in installer and think that others are yeah yeah second citizens so we should replace this not so so active desktop with our desktop and so on and uh, yes team don't want to uh, maintain it such list and also don't want to make these decisions because yeah it's always yeah it's something like flame you cannot win so uh, what's the what's the result is this simple simple dialogue that allows KDE in and gnome which we still see as a major ones that use a majority of new users uh, there is server for a quick installation of text mode and then there is a custom and custom opens a patterns selector and uh, so it means that any new desktop only thing that they need to do is uh, have a, its pattern in uh, in a repository. They maintain this pattern. They decide what's what's used as uh, login manager and such stuff because everything is in pattern. And one more advantage is that on this same screen you can configure online repositories. So it means that, for example, if uh, Leap is released uh, half a year ago and there is a new cool desktop that you would like to have in this uh, older Leap, you can just uh, send it to uh, update repository and then if you install with network, you have this update repository and the patterns that will be also in update repository is shown in this custom. So in fact, you can install a desktop that's not yet available uh, when uh, the DVD is released. 
Yeah. That's more like uh, for developers, but you can maybe also notice it because uh, we integrate uh, debugger Ruby, debugger and profiler. It can be started by common environment variables that uh, you just define it and it, it, uh, the, the just start in debugger and profiler. But how you can see it is if Yast somehow uh, crashes, especially in installation, then it show pop-ups and in this pop-up you can click on the button that you would like to debug this issue and it will, it will show the Ruby debugger and you can play with it. So not so much for end users, but very useful for uh, yeah, developers to see what's exactly going wrong. And for example, even users can, can go to, to this debugger and try something some commands that's uh, suggested by developers if it's really one machine problem. If you cannot reproduce it, then you have full uh, environment for debugging. So, so it also helps us with some cooperation when something goes wrong. Yeah, as I mentioned, it's on system and on in installation. By default, the dependency is not installed on system. So if you have just on system, the, the debugger is not there, but in installation, uh, it's part of a uh, installation system, so it's always there. And if you are not uh, native speakers, uh, English native speakers, uh, it can also maybe help you that uh, just switch to OpenSUSE WebLate. Uh, there's URL. I tried before this uh, presentation and I have to say I'm quite impressed because uh, in past I tried some translation using VI, which is yeah cool and hacker way, but this uh, web UI really helps with some associations. For example, you translate some string and it and gives you 10 different uh, strings that's translated and that contains similar words. So you have some idea how, how it's translated at, at other parts and it helps you have consistent translation so just using uh, this WebLate for translating now, and I encourage anyone to just try it and see if maybe you can improve. Uh, yeah, not uh, just Yast translation, but there's also other projects that's in OpenSUSE. So you can help your colleagues that don't speak English. Yeah, and we have a new module for alternatives. It's a result of uh, Google Summer of Code. It was implemented by uh, Joachim, which was a Google Summer of Code student. And uh, you can met him last year because he was here at the conference. And uh, yeah, if you don't know what's alternatives, just quickly, it's a, a system how you can switch uh, implementation. If there's uh, several forks of some projects, you can easily switch between them. It's used, for example, for uh, AVKey. You can, uh, I think it's also heavily used by Java to switch if you have multiple Java environments. What's default one? Yeah, and there's a salt integration into auto installation and also experimental puppet. That's, uh, if you are interested into it, I really suggest to see a video for morning talk uh, that was made by Imo. Yeah, and there's a new storage stack, which is, yeah, some, some redesign of storage code. It's, uh, yeah, it, every part is touched. It allows new features because, uh, yeah, the, the hardware renders are so crazy it allows new fancy hardware that have various support, also kernel guys, yeah, add crazy features to BTRFS and we need to somehow support it. So you will see it and there's uh, here at two o'clock, Arvin will present about it. So I would like to invite everyone to see this talk if you are interested. So some references, you can find us on GitHub. CFA is also on GitHub and WebLate is here. I will paste a presentation to speaker deck if you are later interested. 
You can also contact us. We have uh, web pages. Uh, we, are, we have IRC, email. And the last but not least, we have also our uh, blog, which currently lives on Lizards. And it's also source of this presentation, because I picked the most interesting stuff from our blog. So if you are uh, interested in what's happened in IAST, in IAST, usually each, every three week, we, we post here a blog post, what's, what's new. So I would like to well, uh, thanks everyone for attending. And if you have questions, just ask. Yeah, looks like everything is clear, so thanks for your attention. <laughs>